As many of you will know, um, we lost our king last, last week, so uh, I suppose it's fitting to be talking about Mahanakorn, Thailand's tallest building being complete this year because he was always renowned as the development king. He transformed Thailand from an agricultural country to the country that you see today. Uh, so um, please bear with me. So today we'll talk a little bit about Mahanakorn, the observatory, and then some final thoughts regarding creating uh, super tools uh, in Thailand. So what is Bangkok? It's part of the ASEAN trading bloc uh, within Thailand. It's our capital city. ASEAN is uh, 10 countries, 600 million people, uh, land area of 4.5 million square kilometers, extending all the way from Myanmar down to Indonesia. Uh, and if we zoom in, uh, you can see there it is uh, Bangkok, right in the center of Thailand. Zoom in a little bit further. Bangkok is a population of about 15 million people, so maybe not so different to Shenzhen. Has a very high number of tourists and a very similar climate to the weather that uh, we're experiencing at lunchtime outside. It's, it's warm. Now, historically, uh, as a city, it's a port. It was famous for uh, its wildlife. We use um, the buffalo, we use elephants uh, to do the work, uh, and empty streets. But if we fast forward to today, well, streets are not quite so empty. It's, it's famous for bad traffic, famous for floods, uh, famous for crowds and crowds of people everywhere. But it's also famous for some good things as well. It's got great shopping, uh, great cultural attractions, and uh, it would be fair to say it's a... Um, it's a hub of construction at the moment uh, for, from the airport through to buildings like Mahanakorn. And in terms of price, which is a driving factor for a lot of developers, uh, Bangkok is cheap. If we compare, it's cheap compared to Singapore, four to five times uh, the price in Singapore versus Bangkok, 10 times the price of Bangkok in Hong Kong, 12 in London, eight to 15 times in New York. This is a driving factor why super tall can be financially viable in Bangkok because it is possible to uh, price a little bit higher than your competition and yet still remain regionally very attractive. On the flip side, why wouldn't you just build a super tall hotel? Uh, well, because our average room rate is very, very low. For those of you who like staying in great hotels, Bangkok is like ranked 53rd most expensive city. It's uh, 126 uh, US dollars per night. And yet, maybe that's one of the reasons why we attract so many tourists. We get 18 million tourists a year to, uh, to Bangkok in the year 2015. Uh, second only to London, I believe 2016 is the year that we actually surpass uh, London and become the world's most popular tourist city. Uh, which is a quite extraordinary statistic, but uh, it's a driving factor behind why we created Mahanakorn. And I suppose one of the interesting things for everybody that visits Thailand uh, is this awkward, yet not so awkward, sit, sitting alongside of uh, the very cheap versus the very expensive, the street side food versus the uh, fine dining. You see it everywhere throughout the city. And so with that in mind, you'll, you'll see actually the slides that I'm presenting are quite different than maybe what you have in your presentation kit. Uh, we refine continuously, or we do things at the last minute, though. depends, I guess, how you look at it. We had an architectural brief where we wanted to achieve many things. I'm not going to go through each point, but typical of most briefs, we wanted to do a mixed-use development, we wanted to achieve highest price, best yield. We had very specific uh, mix in terms of the residential unit sizes uh, that we wanted to achieve. It needed to reflect Thailand and Thai culture. Not so easy to balance uh, many of these competing requirements on a relatively tight inner city site. But really, I think the, the nub of it is we wanted to achieve a premium price, and the hypothesis is that we could get there by providing a premium quality, by providing branded services in the residences, uh, by creating a unique design, by trying to focus on creating something very tall uh, in a prime inner city location. Which brings us to the planning of 
Mahanakorn. So for those of you who know Bangkok, um, pretty much anywhere that's not on the SkyTrain now is considered outside the CBD. You really have to be on the uh, SkyTrain, which is our like uh, mass transit system, to be considered part of the uh, CBD area. This is the Saton Silom CBD uh, district. So it's famous for office towers. It has a lot of embassies. But at the time in 2008, it was maybe a little bit a second cousin, a poor second cousin to Sukhumvit or Siam areas. There hadn't been a lot of development going on. But that was about to change because when we secured the site for Mahanakorn, right nearby there were a number of new developments about to take place as well. And so very importantly, we were right in front of the BTS station. And our idea was to create what we call hotel-branded residences. So this is the concept of a freehold condominium uh, that also has the services of a hotel. So in our case, at the beginning, we had in mind it would be an international brand operator like Mandarin Oriental, Ritz-Carlton, Marriott, Four Seasons. Um, there would be a luxury hotel that linked back to the same brand as the residences, a lifestyle community mall, there would be some sort of viewing deck, bar, and uh, public square. So in our mind, we already had uh, the components thought out, um, and I suppose the challenge for us uh, architecturally was to try and create a building that incorporated them in a successful manner. But of course, Thailand being Thailand, uh, we have a lot of restrictions. Um, there are all sorts of zoning restrictions with regards to this specific site. Yes, it's very deep, but then you need to push the tower all the way to the back. But if you do that, then you don't have direct access to the, uh, the BTS station at the front. So there were a number of site zoning challenges uh, in terms of access that were not even very clear from a regulatory standpoint as to how we should actually handle them. We also had this really big challenge uh, that I'm going to touch upon again um, if we created a fairly traditional tower, we weren't really able to make it very tall at all. The yellow is the design envelope, and the massing diagram you can see sitting inside it, it, it just simply is not particularly tall. It's not a super tall. It's nowhere near 300 meters. It's not even at 271. Um, so this was our first pass of just a blob, what we could actually create. And in terms of aesthetics, um, of course, form should follow function, but uh, Thailand seems to like the form part quite a lot. We have like a robot-looking building. We have pyramids, this building that looks remarkably like an elephant. Um, these are quite unusual shapes. So to be unusual for the sake of unusual, to be iconic was probably not really going to work uh, in, in Bangkok. I'm not sure that it works in some cities now either, like uh, Dubai, Hong Kong, they have many forms as well. So anyway, we stepped back. We were able to solve the zoning solution, which was to come up with two buildings. But that issue of uh, coming up with a form of a tower that would actually be somewhat unique still remained a major challenge. And um, we drew inspiration to some degree from uh, the Tower of Babel, I suppose, where we tried to understand where we came from, the past, Stanley Kubrick, and uh, look at how we could apply that to uh, the site. And the solution from Stanley Kubrick was unique by not being unique, like an absolutely standard block. If everybody else is doing something uh, odd, let's do something very, very simple. But there was one problem with this, which is uh, the height bit kind of got lost there. And so it was a eureka moment when we were able to actually deconstruct the form of Mahanakorn. And w when I say we, I speak on behalf of the design team. I'm on the strategy and business development side. I have no creativity at all. So... Rest assured, none of the we part is coming from me. So the we in italics that uh, uh, Pace came up with is the height solution of pixelation, where like a game of Jenga, if you pull out little pieces at the bottom and stack them on the top, you can actually make the, uh, the Jenga board taller and taller. Well, that's essentially what we did in order to stretch the tower. And our initial pass was 
getting up to 308 meters, which makes it the tallest tower in Bangkok. And in fact, in reality, we were able to go even a little bit taller than that. Now, pixelation actually brought in some other major benefits as well. Selling very high-end residences, it's uh, of high value to be able to say, you own a residence, which is one of one. Uh, and by creating pixelation where no floor plate is the same as another floor plate, it means that each one of the units that sits in the pixelated section is truly unique. That has actually sped up our, our rate of sales and also made it easier to uh, deal maybe with some of the issues that I'm going to touch on a little bit later in the presentation, uh, some of the challenges that Thailand has faced over the last eight years. There is a real connection to the street with this form. It's very organic, uh, and it creates indoor and outdoor terraces that are, that are very suitable, I think, for the Thai tropical environment. So this is the final form solution, sitting alongside our neighbors, such as uh, the robot building and the pyramid and the ele elephant. Uh, and we think that Mahanakorn um, sits very nicely. So some examples from the renderings of how the tower looks. Overlooking the city. Now, one, one question we were asked, actually, just over the last few, few hours when I was standing at the booth was, so why did you decide on the pixelation how it looks now? Like, why wasn't it, like, more uniform? We did actually try many different variations of the pixelation. Uh, some extremely organic and decaying. Uh, some less so. Tetris, if you ever played that game, you show how old you are. Um, pixel scale variation, uh, regular stepping, and it was our belief that the, uh, the pixelation that you see now is the optimum mix between uh, being organized and disorganized, as well as creating sufficient uh, outdoor space for each layout, because bear in mind, you can't have one residence that's 100 square meters inside and 400 square meters outside. Uh, each uh, apartment has to actually be somewhat balanced in terms of the way that it's laid out. Uh, and then we, of course, have done facade studies. I, I think there are many facade experts that can uh, talk to this point of uh, how complex or how simple such a facade might be. You'll note that the pixelation does align somewhat to the views. We do actually have some neighbors uh, nearby, and so the purpose of the pixelation wrapping the way that it wraps uh, around the tower is to actually create a, a ribbon of uh, higher-priced premium apartments that are for sale, uh, and these apartments actually tend to get the more uninterrupted views. Uh, and so that's why the pixelation actually follows the path that it does. Now, if we move on to talking about how the building is structured in terms of the functionality inside, um, well, we have a number of things that we are trying to achieve. We have, uh, looking from a top-down viewpoint, the public plaza, we have the retail, we have the residences, the hotel, the con connectivity to the SkyTrain, and then the uh, facilities that need to back that up, like, for example, parking and uh, drop-offs and so on. But this is perhaps the easiest diagram to understand. Uh, this is how the building is actually laid out um, spatially. So you can see Mahanakorn Cube, the green one at the bottom, uh, is the retail complex. So retail, we want maximum footfall. So it's directly connected to the BTS. Residences and hotel, they want a little bit more privacy. So they're stepped back into the tower. And then, obviously, an observatory would tend to work the best if you put it at the highest point in the tower. So that's what crowns off the uh, Mahanakorn main tower. Even the parking, uh, we've been quite innovative by Thai standards. Uh, we're using a fairly uh, complex automated parking stacker that's like a horizontal and vertical motion uh, system. So we're, we're able to be quite efficient in terms of the parking as well. A lot of the purpose here was to try and break through from the typical Thailand mindset, which is you have a podium, you come in, then stacked above the podium are floors and floors of car parks, and then the residences or the office tower or the hotels are stacked on the top of that, but they're in some way disconnected to the, uh, the streetscape. It's very important in Thailand to be connected to the street because 
uh, everyone from my CEO, Sarapot, down to the maids and the drivers, we eat on the side of the road. We catch motorcycles uh, on the side of the road. Everything is very connected to the street. So to break it apart with a big stack of parking seems quite unnatural. So onto the name. Um, well, we are aiming to create a tower that rises above all hours, uh, rises above all others, um, rising to a new level. And so we felt that Bangkok is rising as a world capital. We are part of that uh, rise, but it's missing some aspect of world-class architecture, at least at the time when we envisaged Mahanakorn back in 2008. And so the name should actually reflect that. And so our thought process was something like this. It should be huge, it should be significant. Bangkok is a great metropolis. In Thai, the word for great metropolis is Mahanakorn. So that's where we came up with the name Mahanakorn. And ironically, it was not a Thai person that came up with it. It was actually a foreigner who's sitting right there, one of our, uh, our sales associates, uh, who actually said, what's that word again that means great metropolis in Thai? Um, it's quite interesting that Thai speakers, we were unable to make that uh, concept leap of actually having a Thai name, because most Thai names are always something from Sanskrit, always something a little bit religious. It ends up st sounding very much like a spa product. Uh, and yet in this particular case, uh, Mahanakorn at the time seemed maybe, does it fit this building or not? Well, when we actually developed the logo, uh, we can now today say we can think of no other name that could fit the building better. And maybe part of that's the typography. You know, for a, for a foreigner, it can be quite a long word to say, maha nakon. So, um, hence, the idea of breaking it over two lines and then putting the square as a concept, like, this is representing the pixel, this is representing your imagination, this is representing the bits that we took out of the tower. And I do get asked that question all the time, like, what happened to all the bits that you took out of the tower? Where did they end up? Well, we'll find out in the presentation a little bit later on. Okay, so onto the timeline. So Mahanakorn was originally conceived in 2008. Uh, we launched it in 2010. Construction commenced in 2011. And uh, the tower was officially complete in 2016 when we received our uh, award or recognition from CTBUH in April of this year as Thailand's tallest tower. But there is still, of course, work ongoing. Um, a super tall is never quite as simple as you finish one day and then the next day the doors open. So um, one of the things that we've actually done is uh, invested quite a lot of effort in terms of photography to be able to capture construction. So you can kind of see Mahanakorn growing uh, step by step, little by little, rising and gradually dominating the uh, the cityscape. So this is the point that we see Mahanakorn as of today. Let's see if uh, we can queue up this video. Maybe not. Okay, so the impact of Mahanakorn. Well, the impact on Bangkok is it's been a uh, tourism landmark. It is now increasingly shifting the center for, for tourists who, who come to Bangkok away from the Siam, Sukhumvit area, and towards Saton, uh, which is a welcome growth strategy for, for the landlords in the Saton area. Um, it will be the city's first world-class observatory when it opens uh, the observatory middle of next year. Um, we like to think it's a globally recognized design. I mean, we made it to the backdrop of CTBUH, so that counts for something. It's the first new super tall in Bangkok for a long time and has set a new standard for residential pricing uh, for the city as well. Uh, over time, we've held numerous events, won a few awards, received a lot of coverage, uh, not just in Thailand, but around the world. And we have 230,000 followers on our Facebook page, 7,000 Instagram followers, 
um, YouTube videos that have anywhere from 3,000 to 255,000 views. By Thai standards, these are quite high numbers for a building because essentially it's not open yet. Uh, so it's just a pile of concrete and yet a lot of people are interested in it. Um, we regularly give seminars and engage with the design community and the student community in Thailand as well. And I would say one of our proudest uh, moments is when we see buildings that appear to copy the pixel concept uh, that are now scattered around the Bangkok skyline. Some done well, some slightly less so. So if we step back to the business case, has it actually all been worthwhile to uh, embark on this endeavor? Well, as a result of what we've come up with, we have been able to secure hospitality brands, the Ritz-Carlton, the Edition Hotel, which is Ian Schrecker combined with Marriott. Uh, we've brought in numerous new-to-market brands that uh, would otherwise probably have never come to Thailand, including Dean and DeLuca, L'Atelier de Joël Robichon, Vogue Lounge, Morimoto. Uh, and we've achieved, I would say, the highest average price per square meter to date uh, of any major Thai property development. We're at the point now where approximately 80% of the residences are sold. So I think it's fair to say that, yes, you can actually make a business case that super tools uh, of this mixed-use type, um, type development, where it's very residential-centric, that they actually do work for uh, a Bangkok-type environment. But as Frank Sinatra once said, the best is yet to come. I think we have to wait for another nine months when the entire tower is complete, and then we'll be able to see uh, the tower in its full glory. So uh, recently, um, we held a Night of Light celebration where we unveiled the building for the first time. Um, the lighting is actually custom for that one night. So if you go and visit Bangkok to no tomorrow, tomorrow evening, you won't see this light show every night. Uh, but to mark its opening, um, we lit the building up so we can see it from various angles, various lights. And so really quite a, uh, when you compare it to all the other buildings, particularly on that image on the, on the upper right, you can see that's the typical Bangkok cityscape. Uh, buildings that are optimized for the regulatory framework, buildings that maximize the GFA, buildings that are very efficient to build. I think Mahanakorn, you can say it's maybe not the most uh, efficient shape to build. It's maybe not the most uh, cost-effective way to create a 314-meter-tall tower, but it certainly is the most striking. And one of the things, as I said, we've spent a lot of effort engaging with uh, the design community. Well, for the Night of Lights, we also engaged with the uh, Thai public as well. We invited them to take photos as, as we lit the whole tower and ended up with 70,000 images submitted to us. So it really captured the imagination of, of Thai people, particularly this year, maybe more so than, than other years. We're currently under military rule, uh, people are quite optimistic about the economy, but there are some slowing down factors uh, in, in tourism and exports. And so to be able to turn and look and see something that Thai people created that really is of a global standard, I think, has been a major source of pride for, for all Bangkokians. And so um, we were delighted to see that we made the front page of most newspapers, the hashtag uh, Mahanakorn, um, the Twitter feed, I think, we were the number two subject uh, for that night of the 29th. These all reflect that suddenly a building is no longer just touching the hearts of somebody that wants to buy a residence, which is one of 209 people, or somebody that might want to stay at the hotel in future, or somebody that might want to eat at Morimoto. This is actually touching everyone in Bangkok because now Mahanakorn is so dominant in terms of the skyline of Bangkok. And not everyone likes Mahanakorn, incidentally. There are some people that cannot stand it. But uh, I think great architecture should have that effect on people, that you may not love it, you may not hate it, but uh, it evokes some form of emotion in you. If it evokes nothing, then it's probably bland architecture. 
Okay, I'm going to step back a little bit from uh, the form of the building and, and Night of Lights and talk a little bit about the program components, again, in a little bit more detail. So we have five main elements within our property. So the Ritz-Carlton Residences, uh, which are our hotel-branded freehold residences, there's 209 of them. The Addition Hotel, which is created by Ian Schrecker and Marriott. Uh, the Cube, which is the retail center. Mahanakorn Square, which is actually a public plaza at the front. And then the Observatory, which I'll spend most of my time in the second half of the session uh, concentrating on. So first of all, the Ritz-Carlton Residences. Uh, we have many unique layouts, simplex, duplex layouts, from 120 to 1,500 square meters, two to five bedrooms. We're pushing around 80% sold. At the time that we launched, we were by far the highest price in Bangkok. Um, I'm not sure that we have the highest asking price now in Bangkok. I think there are some developments that have come after us. Uh, as is always the case, selling on paper um, is always... Maybe you can ask whatever you want, whether you can actually sell it or not is another question. Uh, however, I think on average we have achieved the highest average sale, sale price per square meter uh, consistently every year for uh, the time that we've been selling the Ritz-Carlton Residences Bangkok. So this is the benefit of that pixelation concept. You see uh, this is what we call a skybox. So it's a cantilevered room that stands out uh, from the main form of the building, you get 270 degree views. Uh, many of our clients ask if they can jump up and down on the cantilevered section, I would hope so. And then this is uh, examples of the interior finishing. So we have a very high standard of finishing because it's uh, bringing in a brand, the Ritz-Carlton Residences, uh, they sign off on every little detail from the ceiling height through to the choice of lights, through to even how the parking signage works. So every aspect is reviewed by them. So we think it's of a very high standard. This is the bathroom. And yes, we provide that huge tub in the middle. And on to the addition. So the Bangkok addition, the concept of the addition hotel. Uh, again, I was asked earlier today, why wouldn't you have just put the Ritz-Carlton Hotel into this building? The reason why is the Ritz-Carlton does not currently operate in Bangkok, so they expected a hotel of 350 keys. Uh, that didn't really work for us financially so well uh, because of the mass, the size of the tower. And so we really wanted more of a boutique hotel concept. And we were very lucky because uh, Bangkok Edition, the Edition brand, had just been born by Marriott uh, at that time in 2008. So it fitted very well. And so a lot of the back of house is shared between the Ritz-Carlton residences and the addition because they both sit under Marriott International. And so these are examples of the uh, hotel rooms, amenities. And it has also within the addition footprint a uh, very elaborate indoor-outdoor bar, which is sitting right near the top of the tower as well. So this is a double height space. So some preliminary drawings of uh, how that bar space is going to look. So the one element that is already open, so for those of you visiting Bangkok tomorrow, uh, or as the conference finishes, uh, you're welcome to go and check out Mahanakorn Cube. We have many tenants open there. It's fully leased. Uh, ranging from Dean and DeLuca through to a variety of food and beverage operators uh, and some lifestyle brands to support our tenants uh, and support our, our owners. And of course, we, we have such great exposure to the, the main road that uh, we have an enormous media wall as well. It's 1,000 square meters, uh, so we try not to play ads all the time. We actually play useful content as well, stories about Mahanakorn, at the moment, we're talking about the Thai football team. Um, I think in coming days, we'll be showing uh, some of His Majesty's uh, endeavors and achievements over the last 70 years of his reign. Um, we also show information such as temperatures, time, share market. Uh, so it really is a very useful addition to the cityscape in Bangkok. Dean and DeLuca, Vogue Lounge, 
l'atelier, so some of our tenants, how they look inside. And onto Mahanakorn Square, which is the big public plaza that's located at the base of the tower. Again, it's relatively rare for a, a, a developer to actually say, we're going to give space back to the city to just use for whatever you want. Uh, now, while we still own the square, we imagine that it will be able to be used for civic events, so art exhibitions, as well as for pay events, such as car shows. Um, so it, it actually should be able to serve multiple purposes. And it provides a great lead-in to uh, the heart of the city. So perhaps, who knows, the next revolution might even be organized there. So on to the observatory, which is the second part of the presentation, uh, the shorter part of the presentation, I think. The purpose of the observatory, since we've built Thailand's tallest tower, is to provide a 360-degree view uh, of the city. And in fact, from this viewpoint, you can see all the way to the ocean, uh, which is quite nice. So there it is sitting at the top. So our idea in terms of foot flow is people come in through the square, um, they access to the observatory, they purchase their tickets, and then they flow up through the tower. They go up in a high-speed lift, takes about 40 seconds, they arrive at level 74. They then walk their way up or use a, a smaller lift system to get to the roof. They then are able to take selfies, pics, as, as we do in uh, modern life. Then they transfer down on a separate floor on level 75 all the way back down to the exhibition space and then they flow through exhibition and retail back to the exit. You'll note that we segregate where they come in and where they go out onto different floors. It's all to do with traffic planning. And really the observatory has been an almighty uh, challenge in terms of logistics because every other aspect of what we do with Mahanakorn is dealing with small numbers. We have 209 residences, meaning we have 209 owners. The observatory, we're talking about like 5,000 people a day. So it's all about efficiency. If you can get slightly more efficiency, just one second here, one second there, in terms of how the lift runs, you can increase the number of people that you can welcome to the observatory and thus increase the revenue. So let's go back to the walkthrough. So people come in. A lot of these are preliminary diagrams. They pay for their tickets. They ride up the lift in 39 seconds up to the 74th floor. And then once they get to the 74th floor, they get their first glimpse of the city. So this is the indoor space where they're able to see um, right across uh, the city of Bangkok. They can walk all the way around if they wish, 360 degrees. It's very important that we still have some degree of control because Bangkok's weather, when it rains, it really rains. Uh, and so for those days when it's pouring with rain, we still have the ability to provide an indoor tour. Also, the heat becomes uh, fairly unbearable in April and May on the rooftop. So these are examples of uh, people looking out, seeing the view, and exploring, spending time. We then push them up one more floor. So we encourage them to flow from the 74th to the 75th floor, which is where they start to access to go higher. And the 75th floor is also where they come back down again as well. So we, we try and avoid people colliding in opposite directions. That's one of the advantages, I suppose, of designing the observatory from the ground up, so to speak. So up they come. They have uh, places to queue. And then they flow up through a uh, quite elaborate spiral staircase with hydraulic elevator in the middle. And that takes them to the top floor, which is uh, level 78, which is an outdoor viewing platform. So up they come. And there we are, right at the top of uh, Mahanakorn. So they're standing at the highest point in Bangkok. What is maybe unique about our tower compared to some others is they're standing on top of the lift overrun. So if you actually want to get a 360-degree view, uh, let's say you know, using mobile phone technology or a GoPro, you can literally just spin it around in your hand and you will get the full 360 degree view. In most towers that we've visited, uh, the core is still in your way. So if you would want to get that shot, you would have to walk right around the core, which is in the middle. Uh, possible, but maybe not quite so appealing. 
And so we get views all the way across to the river. And this is looking down. Um, now, there's one little odd thing you'll see sticking out to the side there. We call that the sky tray. And this is what we consider to be the climax of the experience. So it's a cantilevered uh, sheet of laminated glass. So it extends out beyond the building. Uh, people can walk out there, jump up and down, look down 314 meters all the way to the ground. Um, and I don't know. I, I, I've been up there. It's so high that it starts to get to the point that for somebody who's, not, who, who's a little bit scared of heights, maybe it's not so scary anymore because it's high enough to not be scary. But if you are scared of heights, I, I think it could be you know, quite, quite interesting. And that's the sky tray, so we can see it poking out to one side. Some of these shots are still under construction, so um, I, I think the glass is not installed yet. So if I do take you up onto the top of the tower, please make sure I remind you whether the glass has been installed or not. <laughs> Otherwise, you might not need the high-speed lift down. So these are the uh, views. So daytime to the south, you can see the river in the distance. That blue line is the sea. And then uh, the eastern view, you're looking across the Silom Saturn business district over towards Sukhumwit. Um, and the view to the north is equally stunning. Spatially, this gives you an idea of how it's all laid out. So the observatory is a self-contained piece separated in the middle from the 74, 75, and 78 with the indoor bar, the indoor-outdoor bar, which is operated by the addition. So they share a common lift core, but the operating hours are quite different. So we believe that we're going to be able to balance this. It's all about lift operations when it comes to observatories because it's so expensive to run the lift all the way through the tower to get to the top. The actual floor area at the top is, uh, is neither here nor there. So some more pictures of the indoor-outdoor bar, double height space. I think we've seen this already. But all good things must come to an end, so I'll just walk you through the uh, experience of going back down again. So the spiral staircase or the hydraulic lift, down they go. They get off on level 75, and this is where they get into the lift so they don't collide with the people coming up to 74. So the lift is always only bringing people up or only taking people down. When they get to level 74, uh, 75, sorry, and drop down to level four, we then walk them through an exhibition which is telling them a story about Thailand, about Bangkok, uh, and also because I come from a retail background, I'm gonna be selling them souvenirs. This is what keeps me up every night. What souvenirs will I sell them? Shirts, keychains, all kinds of you know, really, really classy stuff. Uh, but seriously, uh, it, it is actually worthwhile to, to understand that in Thailand we have museums. Every, every city has great museums, but they're not commonly visited. People like, uh, I would say, edutainment, uh, commercialism that combines something a little bit cultural with something that they can actually seize, take home, put in their hand, buy. And that's why our probably number one and number two tourist destinations at the moment in Thailand are not um, the National Museum. Uh, they are actually... So Wanapum Airport, I think, is, is the number one Instagram photograph place and Sam Paragon, which is a shopping mall. So... For us to buck that trend by trying to do something that's incredibly cultural uh, but yet had no retail component would probably not make a lot of sense. So we walk them through several floors of uh, souvenirs, exhibition, edutainment, and eventually they wind their way back down to where they came in, which was the ground floor. So now we've explored our way right through the observatory from top to bottom. Just a, a quick note on how the business model for observatories works. Basically, you charge a price, you get a whole lot of people coming in every day, you get a whole lot of annual visits, you sell them some tickets, you sell them some souvenirs, and ultimately it should actually increase the value of your development. The jury is still out what the impact will be on Mahanakorn, um, because we don't know yet how many people exactly we will attract every day and what the percentages that will buy uh, souvenirs and retail. 
So that's what drives the development value premium. Uh, we do believe it will be somewhere pushing 10, 20%. So it's definitely worthwhile relative to selling those floors off. Um, I guess that would be the obvious first choice is, well, it's no effort at all. Why don't we just sell the top floors to a wealthy uh, residence owner and they can take care of the whole uh, top three floors themselves. Um, that was never our aim because we started off with the design brief that this was supposed to be a building for all ties and not all ties can afford the penthouse uh, and certainly not all ties can buy it because there's only one. So the observatory was our way of being able to share this, not just for ties but uh, for foreigners as well. And in terms of how many people we think we can bring in, the first full year of operation, we think we can achieve about 4,600 people a day, which is 1.7 million visitors a year. The maximum capacity, assuming that we can get the lifts running exactly as we plan, we can get people to queue up exactly as we wish, uh, we can push that all the way to 6 million. And so at that point, that's when observatories suddenly become extremely interesting uh, as a business model virtually on their own. And it doesn't surprise me that we know of at least two other buildings that are strongly considering doing observatories in Bangkok over the next uh, decade. So as we uh, wrap up for the last few minutes, I, I'll just take you through sort of what we learned along the way. I'm actually only 25 years old, but Mahanakorn aged me like in another you know, 20 years, so I look like I'm 45. Um, Seriously, all these gray hairs are from Mahanakorn, so I am actually pushing 45. Um, timing is very important. When you do a super tall, one of the questions in the morning sessions was how are you able to predict the business cycle for building an office tower for a super tall? Um, I'm not sure for a super tall that you can always judge because you're always going to ride through at least one up and down cycle, maybe more than one. But in the case of Mahanakorn, we've done better than that. We've ridden a whole load of ups and downs, mostly downs. 2008 world financial crisis, 2008 Thai political crisis, 2010 Thai political crisis. Again, the red shirts. So the first group was the yellow shirts. Then we had the red shirts. 2011, okay, no political problems, but now the streets are completely flooded. Great. 2012, okay, we're all right in Thailand, but... Europe debt crisis. God damn. God damn it. <laughs> so a lot of problems uh, over the course of, of Mahanakorn, but I guess um, we persevered, and that wasn't all. 2014, back to political issues. A coup d'etat in Thailand, this one fairly popularly received, but nevertheless um, perhaps viewed not so popularly uh, by people outside of Thailand. And at each step, you can imagine... Our ladies and gentlemen that were selling the residences, uh, the senior management that were dealing with Marriott, that were dealing with our partners, had to have these awkward conversations. Yes, we're flooded, but it's really not that bad. It's only two meters of water. People can still swim. It's okay. So I would say, yeah, timing is very important, but uh, when you deal with this many problems, maybe determination trumps timing. Because after all, in 1930, if we look back in history, the middle of the Great Depression, construction started on the tallest building in New York. The Empire State Building is now a global icon. And we believe that Mahanakorn likewise can be the pride and ambition of Thailand, a landmark and icon for the city of Bangkok. As we say in English, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Uh, sadly, I can't say the same saying in uh, Chinese, but I think you can read for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.